First and foremost, if you don't know uh, who I am, I am Alex Warner. Um, I'm the existing industry project manager for the economic development team uh, for the Forsyth County Chamber of Commerce. Um, it is uh, great to meet you. Over the last couple of months, uh, we've done everything possible to help all of our small businesses through the EIDL and PPP process. And uh, now that it's coming towards hopefully the end of, of these SBA loan opportunities, um, Wanted to do whatever we can to provide uh, our small businesses some some expert advice on what to do next, um, especially when it comes to the forgiveness portion of the the PPP loan. And so I've asked uh, Marvin Willis with Smith and Howard um, to uh, to come and uh, let you guys know from a CPA point of view um, how the forgiveness will work uh, for the PPP loan. I'm not going to go. Uh, too far into detail, as you can tell, Martin has a or Marvin has a very um, long and um, pretty awesome resume. Um, but uh, Mar Marvin is a, a partner with Smith and Howard. He is in charge of the accounting and advisory group. And uh, before Martin or before Marvin, I don't know why I want to call you Martin. Before Marvin joined Smith and Howard, uh, he was a CFO for a large Atlanta company. Um, uh, but we are going to tell you, um, and Marvin's going to—he's going to repeat this over and over throughout his presentation as well. If um, if you would like a copy of this presentation, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. I'll be more than happy to share it with you. But please know this information is only as good as May 20th, 2020. Um, if you were participating in any of the other SBA um, uh, loans or, or uh, um, applications in the past. Things are subject to change, and so this information is only as good as um, May 20th, 2020. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marvin. Thanks, and good morning. Um, thank you, Alex, for the brief introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, as far as long career, most people call that seasoned, so uh, maybe that's what you were referring to. Um, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity today to present for the Chamber. Um, and thanks to each of you who are taking time out. I know this is a, a near and dear topic to, to many of my clients, and uh, I'm assuming to you as well. We're going we're gonna to really discuss part of the CARES Act, which was the $2.3 trillion uh, relief package, uh, but specifically the Payroll Protection Program, PPP, which was designated really to help small businesses, businesses with less than 500 employees, that were economically damaged by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And between the two funding rounds, that made up about $670 billion. Um, I know for a fact that many of our clients and probably most of you, um, I believe they said more than 2 million businesses rushed to apply for the PPP loans. And the original goal of each of these businesses was not to really add debt to their balance sheet, but the idea was that if the dollars were spent over the designated eight-week period on payroll, mortgage interest, rent, and utilities, that the loan would be eligible for forgiveness. Um, and most of our clients, of course, are hoping for complete forgiveness. Um, and so you know that uh, the rules have been changing day over day. And really, really, what they're going to what they're going to the documentation standpoint. Um, also, when the when the original PPP loan uh, was provided, um, the objective was that all of the debt would be considered non-income. And of course, there was hope that whatever funds were used to pay the the allowable expenses would also be deductible. What they're calling the double dip. However, you know that's kind of been closed now based on some further guidance. Um, as many of you are also aware, uh, the application process was quite a challenge uh, with the banks having to establish a process in a very short period of time uh, without really having the ability to do any type of underwriting. Um, I definitely take my hat off to any of the bankers that are on the call today or within the community that stepped up to deliver uh, not only the process, uh, the approval process, and now the funding process. So now that I guess that they're in the stage of trying to look at the loan forgiveness uh, process 
uh, moving forward. Uh, and as, uh, as Alex mentioned, uh, this data is as good as today. Um, I know that the guidance, the loan forgiveness uh, application guidance was released May the 15th. Um, so again, as we move through this um, presentation, uh, make sure that you always go back prior to filling out your application for loan forgiveness to make sure you're using the most current guidance. Um, okay, so really what I wanted to do uh, first was I wanted to cover the objectives, uh, which were really to provide an overview of the three primary elements of the loan forgiveness, review the certifications made by borrowers, which you know there were, I think, 16, uh, provide considerations regarding the use of the PPP funds, and then provide some forecasting and data collection activities that you and most of my clients are, are actually doing currently to hopefully maximize the ability of uh, getting the most loan forgiveness uh, in place that they can. Uh, the slide that you have in front of you now is the loan forgiveness program. Uh, it relates to payroll cost in the eight week period after funding is received, plus any mortgage interest, rent and utilities, often referred to as MRUs, again, after the funding period, and then any reductions based on uh, decreases in the full-time equivalency of employees, which we'll discuss later how they're defining uh, uh, full-time FTEs, and then further reductions based on individual pay cuts in excess of 25% for employees that are making less than $100,000 annually based on uh, 2019 data. As you can see in the red uh, below the payroll cost, 75% of the loan forgiveness dollars have to be spent on payroll cost. And we'll look at how that's defined further in the presentation and then limiting the amount of eligible uh, mortgage interest rent utilities that can be utilized in the forgiveness process not to exceed 25% of the original loan value. So now let's look at step one, uh, which is the next slide, Alex. Uh, to determine the payroll costs covered by the mortgage interest uh, covered rent and covered utilities for the eight week period. Payroll cost, uh, the definition they had, and these were a lot of the definitions that we even utilized as our clients were looking at filing the application for the original loan, uh, where we were looking at payroll cost in general. Uh, we'd gone through and in many cases excluded any individuals making over $100,000 um, and also excluding any sick leave or family leave that would be covered as a credit uh, later. And then covered mortgage, interest, rent, and utilities um, that had to be contracted prior to February 15th of 2020. And we'll talk the, about that a little bit further when we talk about some related party rents and some challenges that, that we're seeing some of our clients have um, as they're doing the calculations. Okay, next, next slide really goes into an example here. We're talking about payroll cost, and this would be total payroll cost of $100,000 in this example. And so if the payroll cost uh, can only be 75% of the loan value, uh, we basically looked at taking the $100,000 divided by the 75%. So this gives you the maximum loan amount that we would be eligible for forgiveness of $133,333. And again, this just goes through the calculation of the 75% and the 25%. And we'll go through specific examples a little bit further in the, in the presentation. Okay, next slide, Alex. So calculating the maximum mortgage interest rent utilities. So don't want this to confuse you. 33% of the payroll cost, which will mathematically result in 25% of the total eligible cost for forgiveness. So the example here is if we had a payroll for the eight week period of $100,000 again, the maximum MRU cost would be $33,333. Uh, 
And again, that would equal back to our total eligible cost for forgiveness of $133,000. Next slide, Alex. So step three, really looking at determination of this, your actual mortgage rent utility cost might exceed what you're going to be eligible uh, to deduct for forgiveness. So we've got several examples moving forward where the mortgage interest um, and the rent and utility cost are in excess of what's eligible in the forgiveness calculation. But first, looking at what your actual MRU costs are would be important. And then we would go back and look at the limitation we calculated in uh, step two. Okay, Alex. So we look at total payroll cost and then eligible MRU cost that we looked at in step three. So in our case, again, that would be 100,000 in payroll cost, 300 or $33,333 in eligible MRU cost. Okay. And then as, as we mentioned, the lesser of the total eligible costs looking at that compared to the principal amount of the loan, the amount that you receive through the application process. Um, that would be basically what we're trying to work toward making 100% forgivable. Okay, Alex. So here's our first example. So in this case, um, our principal loan balance was a million dollars. And of that million, 800,000 is what we project our total payroll costs will be. We've looked at our mortgage interest rent utility cost. So all in, it looks like for the eight week period, we're gonna have payroll cost of 800,000 and MRU cost of 500,000. If you notice in, in number four on this example, the maximum eligible MRU cost would be limited. So we would take our payroll cost of 800,000 times the 33.334% to get what our maximum eligible MRU cost would be. So when we look at what our total forgiveness uh, eligible cost would be, it would be the 800,000 in payroll cost plus the eligible MRU cost. So the maximum we could be forgiven would be a million six uh, sixty six thousand six sixty seven, which again would exceed our original loan amount. So in this example, we would have a hundred percent forgiveness um, on our loan if our numbers actually were worked out to be eight hundred thousand in payroll cost, and then our eligible MRU cost um, of two hundred and sixty six thousand. So in this case we would have 100% forgiveness. Alex? In our example two, we kept the loan amount the same, but our payroll cost actually went down a couple hundred thousand dollars. Our mortgage interest, rent, utility cost remain the same. So we'd go through the same calculation in number four here, where we would look at our total payroll cost times the limitation on your MRU cost, again, the 33.334%. So the maximum amount we can deduct of the 500 from a forgiveness standpoint is $200,000. So if you look at our total eligible cost, it would be the payroll cost of 600 plus the eligible MRU cost of 200. So the maximum amount of forgiveness in this example would be 800,000. So in this case, we would have a loan amount exceeding our forgiveness amount by $200,000. Next slide. In this case, uh, we actually had a loan amount of a, of a million dollars. Our payroll cost is back to the 800,000, but our mortgage interest rent utility cost all in is only $100,000 in this example. So we go back through the calculation, we have total payroll cost of 800, so we'll do the math, and that means we have eligible MRU cost of 266,667. However, we cannot deduct more than our actual 
MRU cost are during the period. So in this case, it would be 100,000. So our total eligible cost in this example would be the 800,000 in payroll cost plus the $100,000 in MRU cost. So our maximum forgiveness in this example would be $900,000. So we would have 100,000 that would not be forgiven based on our original loan amount. Next slide. So in step six, we're gonna calculate the reduction based on any type of reductions we have in FTE counts. Now the numerator is gonna be your average FTE count calculated by period for the eight week period after loan funding. So when you're loan funded, this of course is a big issue going on right now in Washington with a lot of clients saying, we're not sure we're gonna be able to spend our PPP dollars within the eight week period. And so there's, there's argument going on currently that they're going to try to extend that. But right now the rules say you must spend it in the eight week period after funding. The denominator, you as a borrower have two calculations here, two options. The first option, you take your average FTE calculated by pay period by month for the period from February 15th, 2019 through June 30th, 2019. And the second option is take the average FTEs calculated by pay period by month for the period from January 1st, 2020 through February 29th of 2020. Next slide. So this is an example of why you wanna calculate this both ways. In the first, uh, in the example, um, number one talked about the average FTEs during our eight week period. And that calculated in this example to be 100. The second is the average FTEs for that February 15th, 2019 through 630, 2019, which calculated to 120. And then the third is where we took the average FTEs from January 1st, 2020 through February 29th, 2020, and we calculated 105. So number four, really you wanna take your most advantageous percentage. So in, in our case, it would be taking the average FTE eight week period divided by the FTEs from January 1st, 2020 through February 29th, 2020, which gives us 95%. If you were to use the average for the February 19 through June 30th of 19, you would actually come out with 83%, which would be a 12% loss, uh, or I should say a 12% increase in the amount of forgiveness that would be lost using that second calculation. So you wanna work and use both of these to see what's best for you relative to coming out with the best percentage. Next slide. Step seven is really where we would look at the reduction in the maximum forgiveness based on pay cuts that were greater than 25% for employees making less than $100,000. And again, this is based on 2019. And that will be determined employee by employee. And uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, many of our clients, as they were going through the initial application process, went ahead and excluded uh, the individuals that made over the $100,000 um, so that our calculation, which was payroll cost times 2.5%, uh, hopefully would be uh, forgivable um, <coughs> after the eight week period. And it also applies to any employee making less than an annualized $100,000 in wages or any single pay period during 2019. So one of the things that I tell most of our, our clients is um, basically the way they came up with a calculation to determine the maximum per person for the eight week period is they took that $100,000 and they divided it by 52 weeks which gave you 1,923 bucks 
and then they multiply that by eight weeks, which gives you a cap per person of $15,385. Next slide. So in our example here, we ran through the calculation, and again, we're using a million dollars as our loan principal amount received. And then we looked and we said through our previous calculation that we had a reduction in FTEs. Um, and so doing our calculation, we came up with 95%. So taking 95% based on our million dollar maximum forgiveness, that gave us $950,000. So we stepped down our forgiveness by $50,000 through the FTE reduction. Next, we went through and we said, if we had individuals that had pay reductions in excess of 25% for those employees making less than $100,000, in our example here, that came up to $100,000. And that's reduced dollar for dollar. So our total forgiveness in this example would be limited to 50,000 reduction for our headcount. And secondly, uh, for pay uh, cuts in excess of 25,000, it reduced another $100,000 off of our final forgiveness amount. So in this case, we would only be able to be forgiven for $850,000. So in this case, you would have $150,000 that wouldn't be forgiven. But again, remember, even if it's not forgiven, the fact is you have the ability to repay that over a two-year period at a 1% interest rate. Next slide. So this is really an exemption for rehires and I know that there are some exceptions that will be granted. One is if you rehired um, prior to um, the period uh, and so you restored your FTE count. Um, also, I know that there are some factors that will not be calculated against the borrower. Uh, one being if uh, an employee uh, was offered uh, their job back, uh, if they were pre previously terminated or, or furloughed and the employee declines, they ask for documentation on this. So preferably the offer would have been made in writing and the decline would have been accepted um, in writing to justify that. In that case, it would not be included in the numerator or the denominator. So it wouldn't hurt you on the forgiveness calculation. Also, any employee that was fired for cause, an employee that was volu that voluntarily resigned or that voluntarily requested and received a reduction in hours, um, these will also um, not be um, held against the borrower in the calculation. But as I mentioned before, please make sure and look at the most current guidance as you're putting together uh, your forgiveness application. Next slide. So this just really summarizes the seven step process. And so um, as I mentioned before, the FTEs, so looking at that guidance, um, also looking at how they define a full-time equivalent and uh, then looking at the pay cuts and what you could do if you could restore um, prior to doing your calculation, how that will impact your forgiveness calculation. Next slide. So the PPP certifications, you guys that had to submit an application um, had to go through, um, so Alex, if you go to the next slide. During the application process, there was an entire page of certifications and authorizations in the loan document. And if I remember correctly, 16 in total. And the purpose of the certification, again, was to prevent misuse. And you guys have heard on the news, um, and as a matter of fact, I heard today there's more rumblings about the, the PPP and the utilization of the funds and who received them and who shouldn't have received them. Um, the, the overall goal of this, again, was to make sure that the companies that received this um, had an economic uncertainty 
that occurred because of the pandemic. And I'm not really sure of one business that I know of that ha didn't have some type of economic uncertainty. And that economic uncertainty is still moving forward. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, but this would be a document that we had our clients put together, just documenting the rationale for actually submitting the application and the utilization of the funds. And then the last bullet was the funds will be, would be used to retain workers and maintain payroll or make interest payments or lease payments and utility payments and understanding that uh, you'd be personally liable if, uh, if there were, the funds were spent for uh, unauthorized purposes. Next slide. At forgiveness, there'll be additional certifications clearly. Um, and basically, they're saying that the amount of which the forgiveness is requested was used to retain employees, make interest payments, rent payments, and utility payments. And then I know that there'll be additional certifications, so please look back um, at the guidance that was released May the 15th um, on the um, application uh, for And I know also that even in the application process, several of the lenders had additional requirements. Um, so just be looking to your lender as well uh, regarding what they're going to expect. And also we'll talk a little bit later about some of the documentation that uh, they'll need to be provided. And then certifications to hold harmless, really this is because the banking community and the lender did not have the ability to go through a typical underwriting process. Uh, basically, they're saying that they were going to hold the, the banks harmless um, through this process. And um, I can understand why that would be needed for sure. And of course, the onus is, will be on the borrower. Um, so um, those certifications uh, will be required um, as far as uh, uh, submitting your application for forgiveness. Next slide. And these are just other things to consider. Um, and as we mentioned before, clear guidance. I mean, things um, that when we originally submitted applications versus when we received the money versus now we're going to be submitting our forgiveness, uh, guidance is continuing to change. One of the things I mentioned here is just necessary to support ongoing operations. And I know a lot of our clients are pulling together uh, documentation where they have customers that maybe are gonna be slow pay or no pay. Uh, we have uh, individuals that are renting real estate. And um, I don't know if you've seen, but many of the uh, clients are asking for abatement for a while of paying any rent. Um, through this through this academic. So uh, I think what we're doing is we're just having our clients document all of this. So as we look at not only the need, but then the utilization and looking forward, uh, the economic damage is not totally done with any of our clients. And so um, this, the next piece is really just the reasons behind needing the loan. The reason I say it's a living document is we're continuing to update those and our clients are uh, so that they'll have good documentation if questioned. And next, it was the utilization of the funds received were only for the expenditures defined and allowable. There's still gray area there. So um, I would, uh, as you're looking at, and we talk uh, a little bit further in the, in the presentation about how you can look at the potential forgiveness of dollars as you're looking at calculations. These are areas you wanna be talking with your CPA or your banker to make sure that we can maximize uh, what, what our forgiveness value will be. Also in there, I put able, be able to support uh, the spend. I know there's also discussion about incurred versus spent. So uh, we can talk about that a bit later also. Um, and then just carefully consider other expenditures during the, the loan period and then uh, after the loan period um, and not joking about the program. I know that there are many people that are saying, um, I think even something today I heard was it was the PPP dollars were used as a slush fund uh, for businesses. And of course, clearly that's, that's not the case. Next slide. And then just final thoughts. Uh, when 
uh, many of our clients received their initial funding. Um, there wasn't guidance out there that said anyone receiving more than $2 million in PPP loans would have to do anything other than submit an application uh, for forgiveness. Now the SBA has added in that there will be oversight and potential audit of uh, individuals receiving more than $2 million. So again, guidance will continue to change um, as we move through this process. And then ensure actions cannot be perceived as taking advantage of a crisis. I think again, that goes back to the memorandum uh, that we had our clients write and, and continue to update about how this is impacting uh, the business economically and from a cash flow perspective. And then use information as it unfolds. Again, continued guidance. And remember, this will be a public record. So companies receiving these dollars, uh, it will be public knowledge. Next slide. So now we're going to be looking at forecasting and data collection. Um, our clients really, when we started this process, wanted to be looking so they could make educated decisions as they move through the eight week time period to make sure that they could maximize uh, the amount of dollars that would be eligible for forgiveness. So that's really what this relates to. So it's looking at uh, calculating expected payroll costs during the eight week period. And so our clients that have just received funding or have had funding for a number of weeks have gone through this exercise. You can use either the first pay period post PPP funding or the most recent payroll period. And again, this is just looking at what your potential total payroll dollars would be which again will drive the amount of your mortgage, interest, rent, and utility costs that can also be uh, deducted and claimed for forgiveness. Again, you want to exclude any annualized pay in excess of $100,000. So that's where we came up with that cap of $15,385 for the eight week period. Non-US residents, uh, we have several clients that have employees that, that reside outside the United States. So those would need to be excluded if that existed for your business. Uh, paid sick or uh, FMLA eligible um, dollars that were spent that were available for a credit later would be excluded. And then non-qualifying items such as expense reimbursements uh, would not be included in these calculations. And then it says carefully extrapolate pay that's inconsistent from payroll to payroll. So our clients typically looked at their normal payroll run. The overtime, the tips and commissions would be included, um, but just to get an idea of where they would land, uh, since those sometimes can uh, cannot be consistent from pay period to pay period. Next slide. Estimate maximum eligible, uh, eligibility for uh, forgiveness, payroll. So looking at the group health and dental cost in the covered period. And again, I keep looking at this for paid. I would suspect in some cases, we, this may be the gray area where we talk about, you can also look at incurred costs, but right now uh, we're just looking at costs paid during the period. And then total estimated payroll cost eligible for forgiveness will equal again, salaries, wages, overtime, commissions, tips, et cetera and then group health, dental, and retirement contributions. Next slide. And then forecast, uh, again, in this case would be your MRUs. And so the maximum MRU eligible, remember, is limited to 33.334% of your forecasted payroll cost. And then your forecast for the MRUs, during the covered period would be basically two months uh, worth of payments. Mortgage interest, again, includes only interest that will be paid. That's in our calculation. If something comes back on accrued, um, you would want to address that during your calculation. Rents paid and utilities. Also on the interest, uh, one of the other areas we're looking at would be uh, equipment leases. Are those eligible to be included? And it, since it was not excluded 
within the original guidance. Um, that would be something that our clients would be looking at including. And then at the bottom, we're just comparing our total forecasted MRUs to the maximum allowed through the calculation. And again, that's based on total payroll costs eligible for forgiveness. Next slide. Then this goes through just the potential FTE reductions. Um, originally, we were looking at guidance that we thought would be somewhere around uh, 30 hours. Um, it looks like in the calculation data that was released back on the 15th that it may be a 40-hour calculation, and we'll touch on that a little later uh, in the presentation. But these are the two options that you have, again, A and B, looking at doing the calculation to make sure if we have an FTE variance that we use the one that's most advantageous to the borrower. And then if you look at number three, that just really is looking at um, the calculation for the eight-week covered period, um, and then looking at either 1A or 1B uh, to determine the percentage. And by the way, for seasonal employers, we didn't put it on here. Um, it would be for a 12-week period between May the 1st, 2019, and September 15th of 2019 that could be included for seasonal employees up in, in number one of the calculation. Next slide. And then potential reductions related to salary and wages. This is again, just looking at what implication this would have. Uh, remember, whatever the calculation here is, it's deducted dollar for dollar uh, from the actual amount of forgiveness. So again, in uh, the second bullet where we talk about um, the use of the first pay period and the recent pay period to schedule out employees and wages, uh, that would be looking at the first quarter of 2020, which would be January the 1st, 2020 through March 31 of 2020. Next slide. And again, this just looks at what we've already discussed for those employees that are projected to reduce payroll uh, wages and salaries for the covered period by more than 25%. This just goes through, these would be your reductions um, to your overall uh, forgiveness calculation. And the last bullet on that page, remember loan forgiveness is reduced dollar for dollar after the maximum eligible for forgiveness is adjusted for reductions in FTE count and salary. And this, this was calculated in, in step seven example on slide 18, if you wanted to look back at that. Actions to consider, um, hiring back furloughed employees. Um, in, in this instance, we're having a lot of issues with our clients um, that are waiting on customers to return. I mean, when we're having slow reopenings, our restaurants are not able to spend the dollars um, within the eight week period after funding. And so this is a big dilemma that's going on in Washington now is, are they going to allow an extension of that eight week period after funding? Uh, because they don't have the customers, so there's no way they can bring back the furloughed employees or restore the wages uh, to what they were pre-pandemic pre levels. Now, we're also seeing clients as they're doing the forecasting that we talked about in the previous slides, looking at potentially uh, overtime. And that overtime cost, of course, is going to be included in their, their overall payroll cost. Uh, remember the max per employee, but more importantly, make sure that this is tied to a normal course of business need. Um, and then the final bullet on there for a lot of our manufacturing clients are just looking at utilizing employees to, default, to perform defer, deferred uh, facility maintenance. And uh, the bullet we didn't put on here is, as you're going through this process, just make sure that you talk with your CPA, your lender, and, and others as you're preparing to, to put together your loan application or forgiveness, just to make sure you're maximizing. And also keep in mind, 
whatever your original loan value was, whatever we do not get forgiven through this process uh, will still be considered a loan and uh, it'll be at a 1% interest rate repayable over a two year period. So again, um, if you can't fully uh, get forgiveness on, on this, um, the, the opportunity is that you have a two year basis at a 1% interest rate to repay those dollars. I know a lot of folks are concerned right now about a lot of the speculation going on about the PPP loans and the PPP uh, forgiveness. I can tell you that my clients uh, that call and we discuss it, uh, there is clearly a documented need. There has been an economic impact. So we're just gonna follow the guidance and we're gonna submit our application and we're going to try to maximize uh, the forgiveness. So um, with that being said, um, Alex, if you want to go to the last slide. So listed here is my contact information. And um, if you have any questions, which I'm sure everyone does, because we still do, uh, relative to the guidance, what's included, what's not included, uh, we'll be happy to try to respond to you um, and answer your questions as quickly as we can. If, uh, if you haven't been looking from a forecasting perspective at um, how you're going to utilize your dollars and, and what the estimated um, forgiveness calculation might be, I highly recommend you do that. Uh, while you still have time to, to take some steps, try to make some changes to maximize um, your forgiveness calculation. With that. Awesome. Thank, you, uh, thank you so much, Marvin. Um, we did have a couple of questions that popped up during the presentation and uh, um, we were able to get a couple of them answered, but I just wanted to, um, can, can you do a quick explanation on how to calculate a full-time equivalent uh, with part-time employees? Yes, so the way I believe the work is, uh, originally I was gonna use uh, the 30 hours, but based on the guidance that came out, um, recently on the 15th, I believe the way they were calculating that is they were going to, to take the hours and they were going to basically, I'm gonna to try to get back to where I have that documentation. Um, they were saying that a, an employee working 40 hours or more would be considered full-time. And so that would be considered point one in the calculation, so one FTE and anyone making less than that would be considered point five, which would be um, a part-time employee. So I can't find that calculation currently, but that is what I remember seeing in the, in the latest guidance that was released. So, you know, originally I was thinking that they would be using a 120 hour uh, period to calculate um, that uh, but I don't believe that's in the current um, guidance. Okay, perfect. And uh, do you have any insight um, as to how bonuses would work uh, through this eight week period if uh, they were not historically um, calculated in the, in the pay? Well, I personally believe, believe that they would be includable. I mean, let's let's go to an example of where somebody's paying some hazard pay to uh, benefit their employees during this time period because they're having to work um, in jobs that require them to be on site. Um, so I would probably err on the side of saying that that would be included in the, in the calculation. Again, looking to make sure we are looking at our maximum amount per employee uh, during that time period. But I think that would be considered in the normal course of business since this is not a time of normal course of business. So I think uh, giving bonuses in that time period uh, would be justified. Again, that would just go back to the documentation uh, you would provide. And i uh, got two more questions for you and then I'm gonna uh, limit it and we'll have people either email you or email me uh, further questions. Um, 
Will sole proprietors who did uh, Schedule C, will they have to do any sort of payroll calculations that are different than how they did it in 2019 in order to show for this eight-week period? Not that I'm aware of. I haven't done through that calculation yet, but, uh, but I would think not. I would think, again, from a documentation perspective, there will be clear guidance relative to what they're going to need to submit to justify the forgiveness calculation. Okay. And um, that one kind of falls into this, this, the same realm. But if, um, just to clarify, if you add employees after after funding, um, how will that um, equate to the to the to the average number of full time employees throughout the eight weeks? I think that would just go into your average calculation. Okay. And uh, for owners paying themselves, um, any special documentation that you see? I think just making sure that your maximum, you're, you're not exceeding the maximum amount required. And, and I, again, that would go back to, it, has that been in the normal course of business? Uh, and typically that would be the case in most of our clients because they would be in an excess typically of $100,000. So that cap would be what they would have utilized, not only uh, looking at 19, but also in the current year. That is that is awesome, uh, Marvin. I want to thank you again for uh, uh, putting this presentation together for us to help out our small businesses. And again, uh, to anyone that is participating in the call, if you would like a copy of this presentation, my email address is at the very top of the chat. Please send me an email. I will be more than happy to get you a copy of this presentation. Also, um, but if you, if you would like to contact uh, to Marvin with a specific question, um, his email address is is on the screen as well. Um, if if you need anything else, please reach out to us. We have uh, um, we're, we're putting everything possible together at the Forsyth County Chamber to help out our businesses. Um, so if there's something that you need specifically, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to put a presentation together um, to, to help out in any way that we possibly can. Um, and with that, I'm going to let uh, Alan Najar with Smith & Howard uh, turn on his mic to give some closing remarks. Super. Thanks, Alex, and thanks, Marvin, for an excellent presentation. One of the things that Marvin stated that I can't state enough is probably one of the most important things you need to take away from this. In the 11-page um, application and instructions that came out last Friday, the very opening sentence says to apply for forgiveness you have to complete this application and submit it to your lender. It's your lender who helped you get the loan. Um, please keep in mind that you need to go back to your lender with this application, which is a couple of pages. There's a couple of schedules and tables. They have to agree with you, accept that, and it'll be your lender again that submits to the SBA this application for forgiveness. So if there was ever a time for you to talk to your banker on a regular basis, it's right now and also to your CPA. Um, if they have any questions, uh, that Marvin would be happy to help them. It's an industry issue, not just our issue. We're certainly to help our current clients, but also members of the chamber with the issues in front of you. But uh, please remember to keep your banker and your CPA informed when you submit that application. If you don't want a whole lot of scrutiny afterward to answer a lot of questions, get it right the first time, and that's where your banker and your CPA can come in and take care of that for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alan. And uh, Marvin, thank you again. And uh, if you would like a copy of this presentation, please reach out to me. Um, but just one final time, this information is only as good as May 20th, 2020. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, participating in the call. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and close it out. Thank you.